and welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight we're going to be talking about creating language teaching materials for the native language classroom. And uh, this will, I'm certain, will have to be a two-part program, as so many of ours are, um, because there's an awful lot of material to cover. Tonight we'll cover some of the basics, and then on a later program in a few weeks, uh, we'll have someone come on and show a lot of materials that she has created. I'm just going to show you samples of various different types of things and talk about how to create things. She'll show you more specific examples, and then I hope to also um, show a videotape to show some of the creative ways that videotape can be used for the language teaching classroom. Now, first of all, I'd like to mention that um, language teaching materials are not something that only teachers would be interested in creating, I think. Obviously, if you're, if you're teaching a class or thinking about teaching one, you would need to think about these things, and you probably have already begun to do so. But I think it's a good uh, program for people to watch who are going to be studying a uh, uh, an Indian language as well, because things that can be used in the classroom very often can be adapted for home study, and home study between lessons is, all, is very important. Or you might want to take some of these ideas if they strike you as particularly good, um, get some materials together on your own, and then offer them to your teacher uh, and suggest that they be used in class. One of the first things I want to talk about is word lists. Now, I need to have a little statement about word lists, first of all, here. I think all too often people think of word lists as being the core of a class. I taught uh, Comanche classes with a native speaker, with Lucille McClung, and then with Albert Nakwadi at OU for several semesters. And I must say the core of our class was our word list. We had about 30 words that the students learned each week. And then we had grammar exercises and conversational exercises and, and discussions of culture and so forth that we also did. And the students brought, brought in their own things that they had created. Um, but I always, people tend to think that a word list is enough. And that certainly is not the case. You need to talk about culture and conversation and how the language is used. And you need to use the language in the classroom, not just read lists of words. So people tend to do only a word list. Uh, as I was about to say, in our Comanche classes, I was guilty of using the word list too much. We were kind of starting from scratch, didn't have any materials to go, and it's an easy thing to start with. It's easy to, to lean on your word list and then sort of take off on tangents from that. But I do recommend that people have the use of the language, if possible, be the core of the class and have the word list be the supplement to that. People need to learn how to use the language and then refer to the word list when they want to increase their vocabulary. Having said all that, let me show you a word list that we created for um, a Comanche 1 class. If Bruce can come in on this. This is our Lesson 2 word list. Now, I always create my word lists and so forth on computer, and I highly recommend that. Even if you're not yet computer literate, I would suggest going to your local public library or wherever you may have in your community where you can learn to use a computer. Public libraries are a great place for that these days. And um, can you see that well? Uh, I'll read some of the entries to you in case it's not showing up well enough. In our lesson two, we had uh, item one was, how are you? Number two, fine. Three, I'm not so good, not up to par. Four, point to the dog. Five, very good. And so forth. Um, and various uh, names of animals and table and chair and door and things like that. So it was a rather mixed uh, word list. I always do these on computer for many reasons. First of all, you can type a lot faster on a computer, and it comes out very clear and easy to read. You can use special fonts if you need to use special characters for the letters in the alphabet of the language, and usually you will need at least one or more of those. And that's doable on a computer. It's so much easier than typing something out with a regular typewriter keyboard, say, and then adding all these little diacritics by hand. In addition, you can manipulate this list in ways that I think are very, very useful. And if you're just beginning to do language classes or developing new materials, you are inevitably going to have to make some corrections or additions or deletions as you go along, maybe the second time you teach the class or the third or the fourth. Our list changed with every, every semester that we taught the class. It was constantly improving, I hope. Um, but anyway, this is a sample of our lesson two for the Comanche One classes and what it looks like. And now here's um, one of the things that you can do with this that I think is terrific. You can take the same word list. This list started with, how are you? Fine, I'm not up to par, as the first three items. And then if you have done this on computer, it's very easy to adapt this in this kind of way. Well, let me go back to the original list. Um, we had number, item numbers along the left side. I went through first to my computerized list. I made a new copy of it, which I labeled flashcards on my computer. I took out all the numerals, because we didn't need those. And then I made the print 
uh, about twice as big as it had been on the original list so that it came out very large. And I, in some entries that had some commentary or something, I took that out to sort of simplify the list. And I came up with sheets that look like this. Instead of fitting on one page now, it has to go to several pages. Can we show how that looks? The same words, either the first uh, about six entries, but it's printed much larger. I put a lot of white space in between so that these would come out with this kind of spacing. And here's the next page. It has colt, filly, house, snake, chair so that the English is along the left side and the Comanche on the right. And now once you have it set up like this, here's what you can do. You can take this page and just fold it in half lengthwise like this. So that now we have the English on one side and the Comanche on the back. Then you can take your trusty scissors and cut about midway in the white space between each item, like so. And like so, I won't cut them all, but just to show you the idea. And then what you have is a bunch of cheaply made, <laughs> readily available, easy to duplicate uh, uh, flashcards. So you started out with the page in, in, with the larger print and somewhat simplified. And now you have the English on one side. So this says cult or filly, or foal in other words. And you can drill yourself as a student by saying, mm, let's see, what was the Comanche word for that? If you don't remember, you turn over and you say, aha, it was bukurua. Or if you do remember, you turn over to verify that you had it right. And you can use these just as they are. They're a little flimsy, but they're usable. Or you can take a little spot of glue or paste or scotch tape or something to put them together. Or you can put cardboard in and stiff them, as much trouble as you want to go to. But we use these extensively in our Comanche classes. In fact, this box that I have here will show you a whole semester's worth of cards. Let me get my spider out of the way here. Uh, this is a whole set of similar cards. We're going to eat lunch. And so forth. And this is about 500, this is about a 500 word vocabulary that fits in a little box like this, and it's real handy. And it's especially handy when the students are studying for exams. They can review the whole course. They can go through the list. The ones that are easy, they put in one pile. The ones that they're not so good at, put in another pile. Go through that pile again, and so on, until you're, until you're good at all of the words. So I'm really a, a big fan of flashcards. And there's an example of how you can make some. Of course, you can do this for any language. and. Uh, it does help enormously if you have a computer because it saves you an awful lot of retyping and you can manipulate the, the size and the spacing so easily. Uh, another word about uh, vocabulary, uh, I was recently at a language uh, conference in uh, Preston, Oklahoma, and uh, there was an a teacher of absentee, uh, an absentee woman who was a teacher of Shawnee. Her name was uh, Jennifer Macasia. And she was demonstrating some of the t materials that they had made. They had, uh, I don't remember her showing word lists as such. They had a lot of picture books with uh, a picture of something and then the word under it. But she had something that I thought was really creative I'd never seen before. She took a piece of construction paper and wrote, uh, I guess you would have to fiddle with this and figure out where to put the different words, but she wrote six different uh, Shawnee words on it and folded it up in such a way that you had a cube and each side of the cube had a Shawnee word on it and it was sort of plasticized or covered in something to make it a little more durable. And then you took this cube, which was about this big, cubed, and kind of tossed it on the table, and whichever word came up, the student was supposed to read. So it was a creative and fun way to learn how to uh, read Shawnee words as, as they wrote them in their classroom. So once you have basic word lists, you can do a lot of more interesting and creative things with them. Flashcards, uh, cubes for drilling yourself, and uh, all sorts of interesting things. Then, of course, you can do, uh, let's move to a little bit, uh, Oh, let me, before I get off of flashcards, let me show you something. I want to recommend that anyone who's in this business or who's in a class and might want to help their teacher out, that they look into some kind of uh, educational product store. Um, we have one in uh, Norman, and I'm sure there are quite a few probably in Oklahoma City as well. Uh, I just forgot the name of that store. I've got it here somewhere. Copeland's on Main Street. Is, is one, it's an office supply store, but they also have a large section of educational supplies where you can get things like, for instance, these cards. You can get flashcards ready-made for different languages, but probably not for Kaya, or Comanche or so forth. But you can get uh, this kind of box of cards if you want to make this kind of flashcards. And these are just high-quality cardboard, stiff and in a, this kind of size. And you can make flashcards on those or draw a picture on one side and have a word on the other. You, you can do all sorts of fun things with these blank um, flashcards. You can cut them in half, as I did. I made little flashcards for a, a Comanche class once. Um, so that's one thing that you can get in a place like Copeland's, and I'm not pushing Copeland's specifically, it's just that as far as I know it's the only store that has this kind of material 
in Norman. I may be wrong on that. You can also get specialized things. Now, these are obviously made with the English-speaking student in mind, but as long as they don't have English written all over them, you can adapt them very easily to an Indian language classroom. These are number cards, and they have numbers all the way up to 100, I suppose. It seems to be blank on top. But here we have the number one, and it says one on the back. So you can teach a, an English-speaking student how to spell the word for one. Uh, but you can also speak a Comanche-speaking stu student uh, what the word for one is by just simply using the one side. Or you can take something and paste over the back and put the, uh, the word for the number in your own uh, native language that you're teaching. Anyway, materials like this probably were invented with the English language in mind, but they are not so English-oriented that they can't be adapted very easily for, for use in a classroom where you teach any language you want. And these sort of things can also be homemade pretty easily. For a long time, before I had money to buy any of the professionally made things, I was taking um, the white cardboard, there's a very white cardboard that you get inside of shirt packages, in that the shirt is folded around, or you can get the kind of white cardboard that comes inside of pantyhose, which is about this size, nice for a little classroom uh, teaching device. And uh, you can just collect a bunch of those and make classroom materials out of those as well. Then I was going to move on and talk about um, posters. You can take either art of some kind or photography and make wonderful posters and then put a word or a phrase or a title in your language at the bottom of the poster. And that's a nice thing to have in the classroom, probably a more permanent thing that you would just have up on the wall. Um, a good example of a source for ready-made posters that don't have any English showing on them is a poster like our um, coyote that I always have on the set here. This is one of my favorite posters. And you can get these at any uh, national park. The National Park Service um, puts these out, and they cost incredibly little, something like $2 each. And there are lots of, uh, you know, they're wildlife, so you, a lot of them will be things that you might want to be talking about in your classroom anyway, animals that exist in Oklahoma and that you would want to teach the name for. So you can take these and label them or not, or just use them to talk about the animal. You can also do your own photography, or you can recruit your students to do photographs. Sometimes uh, the discount stores or the discount drug stores and places like that that do relatively cheap uh, photography, uh, film processing, will have a sale on larger things so you can get eight or t eight by tens for two, three dollars each. And these, these are, this is big enough, this is a little more than eight by ten. This is big enough to make a nice um, small poster for the classroom where you can get those great big ones which I think run about fifteen dollars. But if you start with a good photograph, the thing about doing it yourself is you can get the students involved in doing it and it's a more personal thing. They feel more involved in what's going on. And also, you can make it whatever you want. I mean, maybe the Park Service doesn't have the particular animal you wanted, or maybe you wanted something besides animals. You can take your camera out and just get whatever you want and make your own posters. And I really encourage people to do that. Let's see. So of course, you can uh, get recruit some of your native artists in your tribe, too. And uh, it's good publicity for them to, uh, to produce things uh, that are going to be used in classrooms and so forth. You can sometimes work out some nice cooperative agreements with them and have them donate some artwork or, or make it available on some special basis and make posters in that way and label them or not with the vocabulary that you're trying to teach. Another good thing, and you see this, of course, all the time in English language classrooms, is you can have uh, alphabet strips. What I mean by that is when you're in a, an elementary school classroom, usually you'll have blackboards or whiteboards or whatever they have nowadays. And then along the top of them, there's often a strip that illustrates each each of the letters of the English alphabet, and then a picture next to it of something that starts with that letter. Well, of course, you can do the same thing with the alphabet for your language, too. And this is something you could just do by hand, or you can make it as professional as you can afford to or have the time to or whatever. The Comanche tribe has come up, the uh, language, Cultural and Language Preservation Committee of the Comanche tribe has come up with these t-shirts. They use these as a... Uh, uh, a fundraising item because they're very popular and they have the letters of the Comanche alphabet and an illustration of, uh, you know, an illustration of something that starts with that. So for instance, um, the word for corn is honey. It starts with an H, so that's in the H square. And it's, a, it's an attractive graphic and it's something that uh, the children, children like, they have these in children's sizes, of course, very important. Children like to look at this and, and show that they can read off the names for all of these animals. And uh, there's no English, well, actually, I'm sorry, there is English on here as well. You can put the English on or not, that would be up to you. You can have it be totally uh, in your native language or you can have the translation. The thing of having the pictures is that you don't absolutely have to have the translation if you don't want. And while we're at it, the back of this is uh, something that would make a nice classroom poster too. They have um, a child and the different parts of his body are labeled. 
in the Comanche language and with the English beside it. You could have the English on there or not. That depend, you know, that's totally up to you. At the top, the phrase says, Numerequap, that means Comanche language. So I think this is a terrific uh, t-shirt. It's a, it's a good learning tool in and of itself uh, and uh, takes the language out of the classroom into people's lives and it can be a good fundraiser for your language committees. Let's see what else we have. Um, dictionaries, I wanted to move on to dictionaries. Uh, this is a, another very important reason why I always like to computerize the word list. Starting with uh, just a word list like this, I can then make another copy of my word list and manipulate it on the computer in some other ways uh, by taking off the numbers and re rearranging things a little bit, taking out the headings and so forth, so that you have just the word and its translation. And then you can take those, and computers are great for doing things like alphabetizing. You can take that whole list and just alphabetize it. So now you can look up each word that's been learned in that lesson um, by its English meaning if you alphabetize this just as it was. So the how are you would come after the fine, you know, uh, eat would come near the top of the list. It would all be sorted out alphabetically. Um, and then, so then you would have a nice English to Comanche dictionary of these uh, 20 words. The bottom is more of a grammar exercise, but 22 words. And then you can uh, make a copy of that file that you've created and then move each of these things over to the opposite side like this. Move the English to the right so that you now have the Comanche on the left and the English on the right. Once you've done that, you can re-alphabetize it. And when you put all of this together, and when you do this for every lesson and then put all of your lessons together, what you'll end up with is a dictionary uh, of however many words you've covered in your class. And you can arrange it both by English to Comanche, as, as we did in this case, and Comanche to English, or whatever, of course, whatever language you're teaching. And this was our very first Comanche dictionary that we created at the end of our first Comanche class at OU. Preliminary version for students based on class vocabulary. Now, this is another thing that we kind of did on the cheap. We didn't really have a budget for materials. Um, I had done all this stuff on the computer. Let me show you what a sample page looks like. Of course, mine is heavily annotated, so I don't have a a good clean page to show you, but anyway, here's an example. I put the heading in each case, this is the Comanche to English section, so the Comanche word, the Comanche heading in each case was in bold print, another thing very easy to do on a computer, and then the translation uh, into English was, uh, and the examples of this word as it's used, were in regular print. So it makes it something that looks very much like a dictionary. You can put a little header across the top uh, with the date or which edition of your dictionary this is, because you're bound to want to revise this every so often. And uh, this, at the end of our first class, I think we had learned five or 600 words. And so this is only 35 pages long, including the Comanche to English and English to Comanche. But it's a very easy thing to do. And the wonderful thing is once you've got it stored on your computer disk, it's a very, thing, very easy thing to amend and enlarge and increase. And in fact, here's our latest edition. This is just the third edition, but this will show you how much these things grow once you get going on them. This is our third edition of the Comanche Dictionary, and it's about 127, 28 pages altogether. But it's the same thing. Things Basically, we started out with our word list. And then as everybody, uh, there were student projects where students went and learned more vocabulary and brought them to the class. We added those to the dictionary. Um, I'm always doing research and learning new words, and I add those to the dictionary. Every so often, we find we have a mistake, and we have to correct it. Easy to do on the computer. You just mark out the way it was and, and put in the correction. So you can make dictionaries very cheaply. We then took. Uh, of course, you print out the whole thing from your computer, uh, hopefully from your computer, otherwise it would take you forever. Uh, and then you take it down to your handy local print shop or um, you know, someplace like uh, Kinko's or AVA, which we have in Norman, or I don't know the names of all the others, King's I think is one. Someplace, uh, preferably cut rate, <laughs> that'll do you a good serviceable job and not charge you too much. And they can put on a cover like this, which is just like heavy construction paper and a spiral binding that makes the whole thing much more usable for very little money, like a dollar or two a copy and then the, plus the, cop, the actual cost of Xeroxing the pages. So I think this one was running about 12 or $13, and we just had the students go out and buy it. So that was their textbook for the course, basically, um, because we're still creating other materials. But at least we have this dictionary that students can use now and refer to. And they have the satisfaction of being able to uh, add to it on their own. When they learn new words, they bring them to class, we check them, and we put them in for the next edition. It's a nice cooperative kind of project. I wanted to talk a little bit about other teaching aids in general and also always thinking of doing things on the cheap because you just never know when you're going to have funding to, to buy your really professional uh, nifty stuff. Uh, you can get, I didn't mention these other things I had out here, by the way. These I picked up, I think, at Copeland's or some such place, an educational supply store. This is uh, cardboard money that you can use if you were learning numbers or learning about different words for money. This would be a nice thing that you could use in exercises in your classroom, and it's pretty cheap. 
Now this actually I got some, in some bookstore, I think. This is a Berenstain Bears book. Uh, I brought it just kind of to, sh just sort of for inspirational purposes. In other words, to show that this is a, you know, very high color. This is not cheaply produced, although I think they only sell for $225. Um, so, you know, the big company that makes these can produce them uh, pretty cheaply. But if you were to do something like this from scratch, it would probably cost you hundreds or thousands of dollars to make very many copies like this because of the color and everything. But you can aspire to do something like this eventually, and you can try to get a grant or get a local church or your tribe or someone to help fund such a project. And again, it can put a lot of your uh, native artists to work making lovely, engaging uh, illustrations that the children will really like and having a, a nice um, story to go with it. I have a little yellow post-it stuck on here because I was using this to, dis to try to inspire someone to do something similar. And this particular book, I, I brought this one because it's called uh, Los Osos Berenstein y Demasiada Televisión. The Berenstein, Berenstein Bears and Too Much Television. So it illustrates that actually some of the uh, professional publishers are publishing things in languages other than English, especially in Spanish in the United States. Uh, and, you know, it just goes to show you can do it in any language you want to. So I wanted to just show those briefly. And I was going to talk about more teaching aids, things you can do very cheaply uh, without having to buy pub professionally published things. You can cut pictures out of magazines. Um, I do that a lot. Any old magazines I have, if they have really nice photographs in them, I'll cut those out and use those in the classroom just to have something to hold up. You always want to contextualize things. If you just go through a word list and say, oh, the word for tree is such and such, uh, or how do we say tree, and the students answer you, that's OK, but it's not great. If you can at least hold up a picture of a tree, and better yet, if it's a beautiful tree, or the kind of tree that you would see locally in your tribal neighborhood, so much the better. And then you can just pick this up and ask in your language, what is this called? And the students will tell you, oh, that's a such and such, and they'll give you the name of that tree. So for that kind of thing, you can take pictures out of magazines, or uh, calendars are another great source. You know, a lot of calendars have beautiful pictures and about this size, just big enough for good classroom use. And, you know, if you have the calendar anyway, or if you can get your friends to collect pages from old calendars, it doesn't cost you a thing to tear that out, trim it up a little bit, and, and work a lesson around that. Uh, I also wanted to mention these two books that are available. These are a little more kind of academically oriented, but they have some very good ideas in them. There's a series uh, put out by uh, Cambridge University Press called Cambridge Handbooks for Language Teachers. Now, these were written very much with the English language student in mind. In other words, the idea would be, um, they, these are used all over the world, but the idea is this is to help teachers who are going to teach people English as a second language. But, you know, language is, is language, and a lot of these ideas can be adapted. There's a whole series of these, but two that I've used pretty heavily are here. One is called Games for Language Learning, and it's uh, ideas of interactive games that you can use in the classroom that get people talking the language. Many of them are very easily adaptable to any language. And this other one I have is called Pictures for Language Learning, <clears throat> which I brought up because we were just talking about posters and so forth. And it gives you some very good creative ideas about uh, materials that you can make from scratch, just drawing things from, you know, by hand, uh, all the way up to cutting things out of magazines and calendars or buying things or taking photographs or whatever. Some very good creative ideas that might uh, be inspirational for people that are creating materials. Uh, how are we doing on time now? I know I'm not, as usual, I'm not going to get through everything that I had hoped to. But uh, two minutes? Really? OK, then we're going to have to save more than I thought for the next show. Let me just say a word about using real objects. <clears throat> oh, here's what, something I forgot to mention. That, uh, speaking of uh, photographs, this is um, a brochure that has to do with the Pawnee tribe. I got it at that same language meeting a couple of weeks ago. It has a beautiful um, picture on the front that I gather is a kind of a and maybe you can get it better here, an archival, a very old, I don't know what date, but a rather old picture of a lot of Pawnees, uh, probably re recovered from some photograph archive. And it occurs to me that something like this, uh, once you get whatever permissions are required or you know, are able to have access to a good copy of a photograph like this, these can be very appropriate because they're totally uh, in the correct cultural context because they would be your tribe. You know? And there are lots of archives that I'm sure People interested in language are usually interested in their tribal culture and history as well, and you know where the best sources of this kind of photograph are. But it's just a suggestion. Don't forget that you can use nice old photos like this. This is just a bunch of people standing here, basically, but they're wearing some traditional dress. Uh, some have feathers in their hair. Some have braids of one kind, some of another. Some are wearing necklaces, some are aren't. 
if you had a larger version of this, you could talk about all sorts of things, uh, from body parts to words for man or Indian or hair or braid or clothing items and all sorts of things that you could talk about based around a, a very simple photograph like this. And it's very culturally connected. And then last of all, I think we'll just end with this idea. I wanted to um, make sure that you don't forget to use real objects in the classroom. Pictures of things are great, but real objects are even better. And we have a Comanche lesson where we talk about natural things like trees and, well, plants and animals, but we have one that's more plant-oriented, and we talk about herbs, and we get into some discussion of medicinal herbs and, and so forth with that. And so I have a little bag here of cedar, and so it's nice to be able to, while you're talking about the word, you can pass a little bag of cedar around and let people smell it. You know, there's something about this multi-sensory -sens input that if you see something and touch it and hold it and smell it and everything all at once while you're learning the word, I think the word will stick better. It becomes more real for you. And it makes the class more interesting, too. So we usually bring some Indian perfume, some cedar, and uh, various medicinal herbs and things like that and pass them around and talk about them and handle them and try to integrate them in the class as much as possible. And you can bring in, you know, apples and oranges and, and you can use your tears and tables in your classroom and all sorts of regular everyday objects. Don't, don't forget to use those and you can bring in dolls. On the next show, I think I'll, uh, I was going to show tonight, but I'll show next time an excerpt of from a previous show where Lucille McClung had made her own uh, doll dressed in the Comanche style, and she uses it, uh, she builds a, a lesson around it which talks about the different items of clothing and what they're called in Comanche. We'll show that next time, I think, and we'll talk some more about videotape and dialogues and student books and things like that. So I think we're going to, I'm getting the signal we have to wrap it up for tonight. But thank you for joining us tonight. We will have a part two, probably uh, two or three weeks from now. Uh, where we'll talk about these other topics, and I hope we've given you some ideas that you can take to your own language classrooms, and best of luck in learning your native languages. See you next time on WordPath. <laughs> Nahene <laughs> Ana ma gwana kita wa pene ma da o ni kita Na hene yo hene na hene yo hene